getting the most out of every ingredient. That's the mark of a maker. The KitchenAid Blender Collection. Welcome to the British Library food season, generously sponsored by KitchenAid. My name is Polly Russell and I'm a curator at the British Library and the curator and the founder of the food season, which is now in its third year. This year, I've had the real pleasure of working with Angela Clutton as the season's guest director. And when we were planning the season, we really wanted to make sure that it was eclectic, and relevant. And this year, um, this year of COVID and of Black Lives Matter, which has so much brought attention to the inequalities in food production and consumption and shone a light on the lack of diversity in the food media and aspects of the food industry. This evening's event, Black British Food Stories, could not be more relevant and nor could our panel. Um, I will hand over in a minute to the chair, um, Melissa Thompson, but just a quick point of housekeeping, please do ask the panel questions. There's a tab at the bottom of your screen and I know that they would love to hear from you. Um, but Melissa Thompson, Melissa runs the food and recipe project Foul Mouths Food. She's a BBC food columnist and a champion of brilliant yet underrepresented people in food. A former pop-up chef, she also writes about food and representation for Waitrose magazine, Vittles and The Guardian. This year in June, she wrote what I think is a landmark essay uh, paper, which changed, I think, uh, people's idea and challenged the way that we think about the food industry called Black Erasure and the Food Industry, which I think everyone should read. And today in The Guardian, she had a wonderful piece published called Fried Chicken and Racism, which she may mention later. So over to you, Melissa. Thank you. Thank you, Polly. Thank you for that introduction and welcome everybody. Very excited about this. Um, I'd like to introduce our incredible panel. Um, first, we have Tukumbo Koiki, who founded Tukumbo's Kitchen, uh, which is an award-winning food brand bringing a taste of Nigeria to the world. Um, and last year, she um, launched the uh, London African Food Week, um, which is tasked with um, raising the profile and creating creating awareness of the African food experience to the mainstream, which is quite the task, I think we're realizing now. Um, and we have Zoe Ajonia, um, who is a chef justice activist and an entrepreneur um, from London by Ireland and Ghana. Um, she's the founder and executive chef of Zoe's Ghana Kitchen, um, Sankofa, and also co-founder of Black Book, a platform for um, black and non-white people working in hospitality and food media. And we're also joined by Riaz Phillips, um, who is a publisher and writer from London. Um, his projects include Bellyful, Caribbean Food in the UK, um, a brilliant book, um, and Community Comfort, which was released this year, um, which is also excellent. We'll talk about that later. Um, and he's also written for The Evening Standard, The Guardian, Time Out, and many more. Uh, welcome, everyone. Hi. Um, I think... Um, Hi, start... it's lovely to be here. Oh, good, good. Um, I'd like to start um, by asking you, um, and this is, you know, uh, because this is about kind of origins and journeys and, 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 and junctions, which is the title of this talk. And, and what I'm keen to know um, from all of you um, is why did you start doing what you're doing? And I know that because of everything that's happened, especially recently in the last six months, that probably um, will have changed. Um, but if I can ask you to come by first, um, remembering who you were and why you set out to do when you started, why, why did you start doing what you, what you, what you were doing? Um, so I started to Columbus Kitchen simply because I got tired of going out to festivals and going to street food events and not finding Nigerian food um, easily accessible. Um, I lived in Washington, DC in 2013, and there was an amazing street food culture there. And again, you know, the only kind of continent I wasn't really represented was Africa. And at the time I'd actually made a joke to my friend that if I lived in DC, that this is what I would do, not realizing that a couple of years later, I was then gonna get, get to London and actually start a street food business. But essentially that was where it was. Um, street food is such a, buzzing amazing experience in Nigeria and I remember growing up eating suya which is like a barbecued skewer and meat I'm um, eating hot puff puff 
um, eating Akara and I wanted to recreate that experience in London. Um, I didn't think that it was going to grow as much as it has done the last five years, but essentially I just wanted to eat suya in London. <laughs> Fair play, understandable. And, uh, and Zoe, um, same question to you, kind of back in, in 2010 when you started um, Zoe's Ghana Kitchen, why, why did you do it? Uh, I mean, in 2010, it was because the universe wasn't giving me any choice, but making me do it. Um, but when I had decided that it was a business, uh, the motivation was the same motivation for starting Black Book, to be honest. So I still had those sort of core pillars in mind of equality, wealth creation, equity, visibility. So, you know, I came into a food scene that was very, very white. And I wanted to show people that there is a thing as a continent of amazing food in Africa. And I was gonna use Ghana as my lens because obviously that's my heritage. But I wanted to kind of change the narrative around A, what Africa looked like, because I grew up in the eighties with a lot of negative stereotypes coming out of the media <clears throat> around Africa in terms of famine, poverty, war, and all of that. And you know, my relationship with Africa was really different and it had this vibrant, joyous culture of food, music, literature. And I thought food was, the best and easiest way to kind of expand people's consciousness around, you know, accessing Africa. So the mission was to bring African food to the masses using, um, you know, my my journey with uh, Ghanaian food and my identity and relationship with Ghana as, as, as the lens, really. And part of it was to bring, you know, I've spent 10 years telling people about these amazing flavours and ingredients. And I honestly naively thought then that in doing that, I would be sort of creating wealth for West Africa in terms of creating this kind of export opportunity um, for the you know, people that grow that food and produce that food and those ingredients. Um, you know, 10 years later, that's really not what's been happening. Big multinationals come and buy up all the crops, buy up all the land, because people like those of us in this room make these ingredients and food accessible and popular and then white industry comes and has the money and the resource the manpower to kind of capitalize on that so that's the only sort of part where my mission has tried changed slightly in terms of giving people that look like me and who are black and non-white food the opportunity to make money and get visibility and also um just have an equal footing with any other kind of cuisine, whether it's Italian or French or European or Americans, like African cuisine is actually as good, if not better than any of those. So yeah, that's where I am right now. Okay. I, I, yeah, I just want to touch on a few of those, um, few of those points. And Riaz, what about you? I mean, you published Bellyful in 2017. Um, and, you know, I, I think with everything that everyone's doing, the position we're in now, you know, I think uh, without kind of trying to, praise you guys too much but it just blows me away that you kind of have had the foresight to see that this was needed it's been needed for a long time and obviously that's really come into focus but what prompted you Riaz to to start doing what you're doing um I think for me there was like a realization that the representation and awareness of Caribbean food was still really lacking I think sometimes when you have like a pivotal moment where you know one person in the scene gets really famous or one particular meal gets really famous that kind of puts papers over the cracks to make you believe that some kind of progress has been made. But for me, I just felt that the representation of uh, Caribbean food as a whole was really shallow. Um, in particular, it was always going back to one certain meal of like jerk chicken. Um, sometimes I'd read guides where they were talking about a, a Trinidadian restaurant uh, in relation to its jerk chicken. Uh, and for anyone who knows the distance between Jamaica and Trinidad is the same as London and Estonia. So for me, I just thought it was ridiculous how it just seemed almost lazy for lack of a better word, the research and the depth that had gone into it. Um, and at that point, the only thing that really existed were cookbooks. And I kind of just wanted to do something a bit different that a provided some sort of entry level representation to the cuisine of my heritage and then be also shone a light on all the people and individuals who've been doing it for you know decades some some of the places I went to had been open for generations since the 1950s uh, and they'd rarely gotten any newspaper coverage any magazine coverage any media coverage whatsoever 
Uh, and I just thought that was shocking, especially in relation to these physical, this physical presence on a lot of these high streets and how that was being like erased, erased uh, when you talk about things like gentrification. Uh, and I just thought at that moment in time was like a perfect time to try and document all that. I'm glad you did. It's, um, it's a brilliant book. Uh, and so, so all of, I mean, all three of you have spoken about um, a lack of representation, um, which I think is, um, you know, I think I don't think it's overregulating it to say that that seems really um, a, a, a problem that's not specific to black food in Britain, but it's it's probably most evident. I think. Um, I mean, what have been the obstacles to to sort of food from, from African countries and from the Caribbean islands hitting the mainstream? To combo. Um, I remember in the early days of um, trying to even go to street food festivals and I would contact the organizers and they would tell me, oh, we already have an African food trader. And it would be like, well, you do realize that Africa is a continent with <laughs> over 54 countries. And also, even if you had a Nigerian food trader, that shouldn't stop you having another you know, giving another Nigerian food trader an opportunity because even within Nigeria alone, there are 254 tribes. The food that we eat differs across region to region. So there's not saying that just because you've got Sukumba's Kitchen doesn't mean that somebody else from Nigeria would be cooking the same food that I'm cooking. And so for me, it was just that, you know, that barrier to even get in to be able to actually give um, people the opportunity to have um, food from um, the continent and from Nigeria. Um, the other thing as well for me, you know, and that's why I'm always very keen to highlight the fact that the food that I do, I do is Nigerian. Um, sometimes I am inspired by West African ingredients because there are a lot of similarities, but there is no such thing as African cuisine because the food that we eat in Nigeria is not the same food that they eat in Algeria and it's not the same food that they eat in Zimbabwe. So for me, I sometimes feel that having that Monica of African cuisine. Again, it's similar to what Maria said. It's a lazy way of putting everything together when actually there are so many differences. Um, in Ghana, for example, you know, we cook similar food um, in, in Nigeria to Ghana um, cuisine. But if you were to look at the BM, the BM beans that Zoe would cook and the way I would cook it, Again, these are the same ingredients, but it will be like two completely different dishes. So for me, it's about really creating awareness. Um, but at the same time, really, I love authentic Nigerian food. I think Nigerian cuisine is top three on a good day, and it's definitely not number three ever. And so for me, I'm always keen to introduce people to authentic Nigerian food that I grew up eating in the streets of Lagos. Because to me, that's the best way to introduce people to the cuisine. I don't feel that we need to change things up too much to bring people into the food that we grew up eating. Because as Zoe rightly mentioned earlier, the food that we eat across the continent is amazing. It's incredible. And we don't need to change it up too much to have other people appreciate it and enjoy it as well. So for me, it's always really about introducing people to authentic Nigerian food but in the way that suits a more Western palate. Yeah, okay. And Riaz and Zoe, uh, anything to add to that? Um, well, yeah, go ahead, sorry, The question is, what are the, what are the barriers or what were the barriers? What, 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 are, the, what, 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 what are the obstacles? I mean, yeah, it's still ongoing, right? The problem's still very much here. Right, but the, the problems have kind of changed slightly as well, actually. But to speak to Takumbu's point, um, when I, you know, I had exactly the same problem when I started. In fact, I had a different problem entirely because <laughs> the only other sort of known street food doing West African food when I started was spinach and agusi at Broadway Market. They were kind of like the most known West African street food. I don't think anyone, there, there wasn't really anybody doing contemporary West African street food at the time. But I had the problem when applying to street food markets and festivals of just a flat out rejection because it was African, not we've already got an African food um, store. It was like, we don't understand this. We don't get it. We don't think there's a market and audience for it. You know, so I had that obstacle of, you know, creating the demand, if you like. Um, and then the problem was, oh, well, so when new people come into the market, then the problem was, 
oh, we've already got African food. And then I, I would have that same conversation of, well, it's a continent, so you don't have all of those countries covered. So let's start with West Africa. Do you have anything from there? <laughs> and then, so it's this constant piece of education. You know, and I've been lucky <clears throat> to obviously have quite a spotlight on my career, especially since I had the cookbook in 2017. But then there's a new problem because there was always the relationship with African food in the UK media has always been that even when I was doing very well in the media constantly, you know, when I had a restaurant in Brixton and all that stuff, there was still this kind of um, concept of it had to be traditional or authentic. And, you know, that's not what I do. It's not what I've ever said I do. I do contemporary West African food. It's my reimaginings, you know, and I put that into a bracket. Now there's a new, you know, I have a new category for that and it's new African cuisine. And that speaks to this idea that I have seen and witnessed around the world, African chefs or chefs in the diaspora who, who have African heritage, you know, pursuing more of a kind of fine dining angle with it and creating an entirely new type of cuisine from the continent of Africa. But there is still kind of this reductivity, this reductivism in the media of, you know, the othering and the wanting of, but is it authentic? Is it traditional? And then you'll put a recipe in and they're like, can you swap out all of those Ghanaian ingredients for things that people can actually buy? And it's like, well, actually they can buy it. There's a, a thing called Google. You know what I mean? It's like, so you have this demand for authenticity. First of all, it's like, what's Africa? We don't get it. Then it's like, oh, we've got Africa and we think that's enough. And then it's like, okay, we want Africa again, but now can you make it accessible? So you want authenticity, then strip out the authenticity. And then there's the problem of only allowing sort of this one black face in the media at a time to represent something, which is very problematic, obviously, because as the conference already said, we all do it differently. We all bring, like, all chefs bring a different uh, perspective and their own culture and experience to how they cook and, you know, their own story. There's, everybody has their own narrative behind it. But there is this kind of rigidity in the form of public of publishing and recipe writing and all of that stuff as well. It's, there's just so many restrictions actually mm. <laughs> that still haven't really changed. And and yeah, I mean, I could go on for an hour, but I'm not the only person on the panel. <laughs> I'm gonna pass over to Riaz. Um, yeah, from my perspective, obviously I've never run my own street food or any kind of food business straight up. So from like the media perspective, which is how I kind of started off. When you look at that ecosystem, you know, the food world doesn't really exist in a vacuum in this country. It's a part of a greater system that includes magazines, newspapers, books, uh, and TV. And evidently, when you look at the powers that be in those industries that help prop up the food industry, uh, if you're looking for a Caribbean or a Black person of power in those positions, uh, you're going to be looking for quite a while. Uh, and I think that's... For me, that was one of the biggest barriers is when I'm trying to explain to people, you know, the diversity of food in the Caribbean and West Africa. If I was speaking to someone who was from that region, it'd be a no brainer. Like, oh, yeah, of course, X, Y, Z. But because we're not, uh, as some people have mentioned before, it's this really like, like base interaction with this cuisine. And I just, for me, it's just, it's, it's annoying to put it bluntly because I don't feel like other cuisines have to put up with this complete like reduction of their cuisine yeah can I jump in quick have you finished with yeah go ahead sorry um something you just said made me want to say something and now I've forgotten it leadership yes so this is the problem like the culture of all of the of the industry and the perspective of the industry is white isn't it because we don't have any black people at decision making board level of of culinary schools, of publish, of you know, publishing houses, media organisations. So that the point is, there's just a complete massive gap between understanding what a people like us in this panel have to say and how we want to say it, and b um, how receptive the audience is to it. Honestly, I think a large part of the problem, I think, is because the people in power don't understand, they just don't get it. They don't understand it. And because they don't understand it, they don't have control. And I think that there is, you know, if you don't, if you don't have people who understand it and get it, 
there's it's almost a fear of oh we don't want to give this too much room because you know we don't really understand it's you know like giving up power essentially giving space gives power and I think that's where the problem is in terms of leadership and direction and content and true diversity is because there's a little bit of fear I think around giving up the power um, and that's what's required really. Mm -hmm. I, th I think that's really interesting and I think on uh, things that you've all touched on and one of my concerns is that um, um, as with other cuisines um, I, I don't know, I'm going to call it sort of the fuchsia Dunlop effect right so I think for a long time in this country say Chinese food was Chinese food as, as kind of you know from your Chinese takeaway and in the last few years um, now sort of regional Chinese food is being celebrated and I think, say, someone like Fuchsia Dunlop, who, who, you know, credit to her, has done her work and has lived in China for a long time, has almost made it accessible for, for, for white people. And I think, um, and, and I think my concern is that, um, and I'd be interested to know what you, what you think about this, is almost, you know, are, are we waiting for a Fuchsia Dunlop to, to, to publish a book about West African cuisine or, or food from the Caribbean islands before people in this country actually take notice of it is that is that what's you know like i i i struggle to see um i, I, I mean and, and correct me if, if um you know if, if you think i'm just gonna jump possible that because that if you, oh did i over talk someone no 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 just me but i was finishing anyway sorry um you know a good example of what you're saying is ikoi right look at the the clamor that the press had around the Koyi when it launched, and the fact that Jeremy Chan is, you know, not a Nigerian guy. He's he's not white exactly either, because I think he is Chinese Canadian. But there is just this. Um, it it took this guy, a white guy essentially, to be cooking Nigerian food, whether we call it whether they want to call it that or not, with Nigerian ingredients for the big guns to sit up and pay attention and be like, oh, oh, we have a fine dining restaurant. Now let's pay attention to West African food. Essentially, that's what happened, wasn't it? Because look at all the rest of us for 10 years. Probably never met any of those critics in our life, but we've all, you know, us and 20 people before us for 20 years have been cooking amazing West African food, but that didn't get noticed until it's in a specific postcode with a specific kind of class of people going to it. Do you know what I mean? It's like, that's safe for them. That makes it like a safe environment to have the relationship with it. And that, you know, in a, in a way that's kind of problematic. And th this is a, what, you know, this is why it's really important for us to have these conversations. Cause I don't think it's okay for some, you know, people who are outside of the culture to go on holiday for two weeks and then get a cookbook deal out of it afterwards. It's like, what relationship do you have with that country? And the cuisine and the culture to be able to have the authority to do that you know it's like but yet the publishing world doesn't have any problem with that you know <laughs> except if, if i wanted to put in a recipe for fish and chips 10 years ago do you think anyone would have let me <laughs> they would be like no you do Ghanaian food right do you know what i mean <laughs> so there's you like could have done Ghanaian of uh, fish and chips and I did. That. I have, many times but but that's my point is what you know for black people in food a we're, we're always really made to be like in our box like in our lane it's like and then we're kind of there's almost a fetishizing of that as well you know, april jackson's talked about producers saying to her oh you know are you can, are you going to have your your is your hair going to be locks you know on tv it, so they want you to be in the stereotype of a culture constantly and you know when you're not if you're a white person they, you know, historically, white media loves white people discovering other cultures and other food and translating it for all of us, right? All of us don't need that. There's people from the culture who can do that probably better if you were not so lazy and not so scared of letting other people have a voice and some visibility around the, around the subject. And you are still seeing a lot of that now, you know, there's cookbooks coming out all the time where the people are making books about food that's got nothing to do with their culture historically. I'm not saying that that is a bad thing full stop, but it, it is if you're stopping the people who are from the culture producing similar kinds of work. Yeah. 
And, and, and Riaz, I mean, that's what I think was so, so brilliant about community comfort, because not only um, were people doing food, comfort food from their own culture and their own heritage, but also actually people doing food that, that wasn't from, you know, whatever, whatever brought them comfort. And so some people did food that was from their, from their culture and, and it wasn't. I mean, do you think, do you think books like that um, and, and projects in your writing, do you think the message is getting through to um. people? I hope so. I think my ambition with that was to give people a platform to cook and show themselves cooking anything that they pretty much wanted. Uh, I agree with that kind of pigeonhole uh, discussion where a lot of us who have been in that those meeting rooms where people have told us, oh yeah, we'd love you to do this or yeah, we think it'd be really cool if you did this from this country and oh, you're from there so you must know about this and it feels as though we're being judged in a way where our audience is limited by the amount of black people in the UK, as if we can only appeal to other black people when that same pigeonhole doesn't really, it does happen to other ethnic groups, but I find that for us, it happens the most uh, rigidly where, as you mentioned, that idea of only being the black person in the room is, oh, we already did you know, we already published one black person this year. So that quote has been hit for the year almost uh, without saying that bluntly. Um, so I feel like we're being judged in that way. And for me, you know, seeing whatever chef the same way going to Italy and then they've got a cookbook about Italy or they've been to France or they've been to wherever and they can get a, a TV show, a mini documentary series about that. Uh, and yet we still struggle to have the representation about a place where we are all from. Um, so... For me, I wanted to show people who, you know, you're from a certain region, but you don't have to be pigeonholed. Your whole persona, your online persona, your food persona doesn't have to be limited to where you're from, you know. If I'd personally love to see someone who's from the Caribbean and fell in love with Middle Eastern food, I'd love to see their take on that. I'd love to see someone who was from Ghana and they studied in China for a year. I'd love to see what their take on that cuisine was. Um, and we're so far behind that we don't even have a chance to show our own food, let alone to show ourselves doing another food. And I feel like there's some root of intellectualism that black people aren't granted. That is the prevention of that. That's what's blocking it is that, that in, I think, as you mentioned, uh, sorry, F Fuchsia Dunlop. Yeah, so yeah. this, um, the idea that, you know, she can take this kind of like education and apply that and bring Chinese food to the UK. It's like, well, we can all do that. But for some reason, it's like white people are granted that esteem, I find. Uh, and black people aren't given that certain level of intellectualism or education to be able to, you know, show our foods in a certain way. And this isn't just in the food industry. This is every, this is music where, you know, people think that rappers and DJs can't be intellectuals and in actors where they're pigeonholed is that only playing the gangster or the thugs or like my brother for instance who's a tv writer and all he wants to do is write uh science fiction and horror and fantasy and yet he's always pigeonholed into writing London thug crime tv shows you know so it's not just as I mentioned this isn't something that's related just to the food industry this is so much broader than that it's like you said, sort of food doesn't really exist in a, in, a, in a vacuum. And I think sort of the prejudice that goes against black people and food doesn't exist in a food vacuum. It's, it's, it reflects the sort of wider prejudice. I think that's a really interesting point, um, Riaz. Um, and I mean, in terms of sort of access, um, so sort of, you've all spoken about the difficulties in getting into markets and things like that. And, and um, in Bellyful, uh, Riaz, you spoke about Wolf, uh, um, Winston, I think it is, who, um, the, the baker who back in the, in the 50s couldn't get a lease. Um, and actually that sort of thing is still happening now with people being told the same thing. Oh, we've already got, you know, kind of someone doing African food um, and not being able to, someone who couldn't even get a lease in, in, in Peckham. Um, and we've got a couple of restaurants that have opened, you know, we've got a Coco restaurant, um, Shishiru in, in Brixton. Um, Zoe, you're going to be at the Tramshed project at the end of, end of the month. Um, and, and I realise these are very, very small steps. Um, I mean, but do you think there is hope? Um, I and mean, where, where do you see the food scene, um, I don't know, in five years time to come, Bo? 
So in at the end of 2017, I was invited by the food people to speak about the emergence of West African food as a trend to look out for in 2018. And I feel like ever since then, every year, it's like there's a new media breaking news. Um, West African food is the new trend to look out for. Um, and I think all across the, um, not just here in the UK, even recently last year in the US, or was it earlier this year, um, a Ghanaian chef, Eric Ajapong, he made it into the top chef. Um, I think it was like the last three. And interesting enough to what we were saying earlier on about even when, you know, I feel like with African, West African food, you can never to, you can never really please what the powers that be deemed to be good food so someone like herrick who is you know he's a trained chef he does fine dining um, in my imagination of ghanaian food but because the ingredients did not meet the palate of the sh uh, of the judges on that show he didn't win and that was simply like the feedback that they gave him basically indicated that if he had done you know what they knew then he would have been the best chef. So it wasn't that he wasn't the top chef in that moment. It was just not allowed to progress any further simply because the ingredients didn't meet what they expect the standard to be. But I think definitely there has been some progress. Um, I mean, the fact that I was able to kind of like launch the London African Food Week last year, and I was able to do that in partnership with Facebook and Google, um, it definitely shows that there is an appetite for not just the knowledge, but actually for people to find out where can they, where can we eat African food? That's the first question that I'm always getting asked, you know, where can I go to have Nigerian food? Where are the restaurants? So it's really about, and I think one of the great things that I love about this new generation of African chefs from the different parts of the regions are we are all trying to put an, um, put um, African food on the map. So when, you know, whereas I feel like the older generation, they were fine to have, you know, the African restaurant, the Nigerian restaurant in Peckham, where only the, you know, what we call the aunties and uncles restaurants, where only aunties and uncles would go on a Sunday or go after work. Whereas now with my generation, you know, we are like literally going to South Bank Market. We're going all over the world to really showcase our food. Um, the internet has been an amazing source of also really showcasing Afri um, African food. So um, Instagram has been really great. But also, and I remember, you know, somebody coming to a food market that I was doing in Tottenham and wanting to um, get jollof rice simply because of a picture that I posted on my Instagram. She had never tasted the jollof rice before but just by the power of her seeing that picture and being you know in the vicinity of where the market was she came out on a rainy Sunday morning to on down jollof rice and to me that's what makes see so this is why we had to keep fighting that battle with the market um traders to say we need to have access to these spots we need to actually have those visibility because if we're not there then people can't even begin to find us um, but I definitely feel like there is so much more that can be done um, and I think it's really about us continuing to tell our African food stories in a way that feels true and authentic to us so it's not really about trying to please um, anybody but really to kind of take ownership for ownership of our African food stories and our Black British food story and also how that merges together because I remember 10 years ago going to you know Caribbean restaurants or Jamaican food restaurants and you know the idea of seeing jollof rice in a Caribbean in a Jamaican food restaurant and takeaway place was almost laughable now in certain areas, it's like jerk and jollof is a thing. So it's really about the way, you know, African and Caribbean food are com coming together to kind of tell this new um, Black British food identity story. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, and, and that's interesting because you're, you're saying about people, you know, the woman who came to the food market and wanted jollof based on your, on your Instagram post. And, um, and I think, Zoe, you've spoken before about, you know, rather than trying to get access to I don't know sort of the mainstream food media and 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 things like that actually maybe it's start time to build our own house rather than trying to you know kind of knocking on the door and being locked out of um of, of the mainstream house building yeah I mean that's a drum I've been banging for a few years actually but with more fervor lately I guess 
Um, you know, my experience, I've been really lucky to work in the States quite a lot. And what I've noticed in the States is that A, you get paid as a black person, B, you get visibility, and C, you're allowed to do it being yourself. <laughs> you don't have to change your voice. You don't have to like gaze down a white navel in order to, do you know what I mean? Whenever I'm published in the States, it's me completely. It's me on the page. There's no restrictions to my voice, to how I want to write that recipe, to the ingredients I put into it. Um, and that's where I see progress is that kind of activity. That's, we still got a way to go in the UK because I'm still getting asked to, for traditional recipes, air quotes, and then can you give us substitutions for all of these ingredients that are traditional? Um, you know, I'm, I'm in the space of, there's so much work for the UK industry to do. Um, and, you know, Black Book has been created as a point of reference and to help those in the industry that want to do the work, but also just to help the people in and outside of the industry who need whatever help they, they, they're not getting from, you know, the white gaze of the industry, whatever support they're not getting, we're there to give it to them. And I think that that's where I'm op optimistic, like Chef Signature's um, collaboration with Chef Mike Reed recently, that exhibition where they, you know, went around the country highlighting chefs of colour for an exhibition. And then, you know, Julian's also told me that he's going to be launching a black food magazine soon off the back of hearing some of our decolonising the food industry talks. And I'm seeing lots and lots of new organisations pop up that are platforms for representation that are filling the gaps that the white media uh, and white uh, food industry aren't providing. Um, they have Bayman Hospitality, uh, media diversified, equal measures. There's there's so many new things that have just been created in the last six months. Yeah. Um, and I mean, you know, there, there it's it's like there's kind of, you know, I'm lucky, I'm 10 years in and I've already made, you know, my relationship with the industry is my relationship with the industry. And I'm, you know, I've got hard boundaries around, you know, I'm not going to work for free. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. And I can understand that, you know, people coming into food for the first time um, probably are still enamored by being in glossy publications, being in the Sunday Times, being in the Telegraph, being in the Guardian. I don't care so much about that because actually I give those publications more value than they give me unless I'm getting paid. But I, I, I want there to be more spaces okay. where people don't feel like they have to slave for free in order to get noticed. Um, and you know, to come points out, we have social media. It's really easy to build network and community um, in a digital age. It just is. So I'm more about that and connecting people where I can connect people and building platforms where I can build platforms. Pivoting my business to to, to lead with purpose and vision. You know, I'm just from now on. That's what I'm about. I'm going to be. I'm going to stand for something all day long, every day, in everything I do. And I think the more of us who do that and speak up the easier it is for the generations behind us to come, you know? Mm. Mm. I mean, and on that, I mean, do you all, and also I must remind people, we've got a few questions coming in, um, but but please keep on, um, keep your questions coming in. And I think we're almost going to be heading into, um, into question time, but talking about that, Zoe, um, do you, the three of you feel a responsibility for what you're doing? And also, um, I mean, does it get quite lonely? Because I think you kind of all set out to do what you were doing and then actually, it ends up taking on so much more of having to be kind of an activist and a campaigner and trying to, you can't just, which I think is something that's really unfair for, for black chefs. They can't, or black people in food and black people in hospitality and food media, they can't just do what they want to do. They have to be, you know, a, a mouthpiece for, for a whole kind of, a whole region. Um, I mean, does it get, does it get lonely? It used to be fucking lonely, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> and it's got better. I mean, yeah. Um, and just to speak to that point of responsibility, I do think that's an important one. And the fact that, you know, black people aren't just, we're not, we, there's so much politics in our existence, you know what I mean? And it's really hard to extricate that from everything else. And, you know, one of the reasons why I pushed and worked so hard with Ghana Kitchen was like, when it got to a point where lots of people knew what it was and who I was, then I, 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 I felt like I had a responsibility for that to not fail, you know, and that was stressful that, you know, that mm -hmm. being forced into media as the voice of Ghanaian food 
and then feeling like, well, you know, all of these new young businesses who have told me they've started because of what I started, I have a responsibility to not fail because if they see me fail, it's going to look bad and it's not going to look good from an industry. You know, also, I didn't want to give the white industry an excuse to be like, ah, see, told you it was a fad, told you it was a trend. So it, it does put more pressure on you. It does put more um, stress and strain. But, you know, as I say, I've that's been a journey from, you know, I've gone on, but, you know, I'm in a different place now in a different mindset. So I'm, I've built a community of people around me who I want to support uh, and who support me. And we're all doing pretty good as a result of that. But I just wanted to actually mention this notion of class, which hasn't come up actually. And we, we, we still mustn't forget that relationship between race and class in the UK and how disproportionately you know, black people and not white people are, are in the poverty bucket or lower middle class or working class. Or, and that's a problem, actually, because even when it comes to appearing, even when you get to a point, right, where you're invited on things like this and people who, you know, I'm not going to talk about what, it's like you, peop, the, the people who organise things or pay people for things, they have to understand where people's coming from like do you know what I mean some people can afford to spend the whole day for a hundred quid um writing a 500 piece essay or whatever other people can't they've got kids to feed they've got bills to pay and they need to get paid properly and it's like this whole you know that's something that has to be considered it's like when we see black men in particular on tv and the, the most prominent example coming to me is politicians right people of, who have some kind of semblance of power apparently and they, they always nine times out of ten they're black men who are very eloquent and been upper middle class they've gone to Eton they've gone to Uxbridge they're all of that and you know there is a danger that, that that's we don't want that to happen in the food industry either we don't just want the people from money power and privilege to be getting those positions it needs to be a broad spectrum of society from a class point of view as well you know and I think that that part of the conversation often gets missed out so yeah no good point I think that intersection is really important actually um and I, I mean to combo if I can I've, I've got a few questions so I'm going to go to questions in a second um but to combo I mean for, for you trying to get Nigerian food into the mainstream um you know has that been quite a lonely journey so um it definitely was a very lonely journey in the beginning, but I think also because, I mean, I have really loved the way social media has allowed me to create not only a community of, you know, food lovers, but also actually meet other amazing food entrepreneurs, chefs, bloggers, who have actually kind of contributed to my journey and my success. So when I started the journey to put together the London African Food Week um, last year, um, at the end of 2018, um, I really didn't have a team. It was just me. I didn't know how I was going to do it. It was an idea that I'd had for a couple of years. Um, I'd gone to New York um, in 2017 for the New York African Restaurant Week. So I'd seen, seen a little model of how it could be done. And so um, I remember in um, April last year, um, just reaching out to people in my social network in the food scene and saying, hey, this is what I'm thinking of working, I'm working on. And everybody's response was like, yes, this is definitely needed. And within a short period of time, I was able to get together a team of 12 people to kind of like create this um, food week. And so to me, it's really about, you know, there is definitely a movement. There's a movement of you know, young African chefs and people from who either have an interest in Africa or, you know, who grew up in Africa or who have those dual identity of being Black, British and African, um, really coming together to, you know, push things forward. So in that respect, it's definitely kind of alleviate some of the loneliness of running a business. But I think in, I think one thing, you know, which Zoe kind of stresses on is a lot of times, and I know I made this mistake in the early days of my business, is you know people forget that we're trying to run a business you know say so it's actually a business and you know I need to get paid and when you're telling me your um, invoice policy is 30 to 45 days after I've you know um, delivered the service it doesn't make sense to me so I'm literally like but if you were to go into max if you were to go into a restaurant to get the same level of service you would pay your bill at the end of the service so why are you telling me I need to wait 30 to 45 days 
for my invoice to be paid. And the minute I got to the point in my business where I actually started putting my foot down and say, actually, my policy is payment before service, somehow, miraculously, all these big brands managed to make it happen. And it was like, oh, but I thought it couldn't be done. So it's really about letting others. So for me, you know, one thing that I do, you know, I do mentor other um, young chefs and food entrepreneurs is really understanding that, you know, we are trying to create businesses and your business needs to be profitable. And actually there's also that, you know, if you get to the, because we all have to define success for ourselves. So I remember again, early on in my journey, when I told people I run a um, Tokumba's Kitchen, they were like, oh, so are you going to start your own restaurants? And for a period of time, I actually started going down that route where I thought, okay, maybe that's the next best thing. You know, I've been doing pop-ups for about two years now. You know, people seem to be enjoying what I'm cooking and there seems to be a demand for it. And there still isn't that many Nigerian restaurants here in London. So maybe I should start my own restaurant. And then I actually had the experience of running my own restaurant for six months. And in that moment, I realized that I never want to have my own restaurant. And that was like my personal decision. And so I made that choice that for as long as Tokumba's Kitchen will exist for as long as it needs to exist, but there would not be a permanent place for Tokumba's Kitchen. And that is something that I feel, you know, I had to come to kind of like terms with it. And even earlier on in this year with the pandemic, you know, that helped me to kind of like put Tokumba's Kitchen to rest in a way, because now I'm like, it doesn't have to be my focus anymore. I've got the London African Food Week. That will be something that I will continue to work on. And Tokumba's Kitchen will exist as and when it needs to exist. And that doesn't feel like a failure. It just feels like I've transitioned to move to something else. Yeah, okay. Okay, great. Um, so um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to um, move on to um, questions now. Um, and Riaz, because um, I didn't get your answer to the, to the last question. I, I think this actually, I'd be quite interested to hear your response to this. So um, first question from um, Gita Mystery. Um, to anyone on the panel, what is your take on authenticity in terms of recipes, dishes, shop-bought or home-cooked dishes associated with, a, with particular black cultures? Or do you believe fixed recipes from the past generations that make things or do you believe fixed recipes from past generations that make things authentic only? I, th I think you get the, the, the... Yeah, I think for me, food is such a transient thing with regard to time and location. Um, and to cut a long story short, I believe that every individual should have license to put their vision to their food heritage that they want. Um, as we see that we're usually the ones who are limited to being authentic, but everybody else can do what they want with Italian food and French food and whatever food you name it but we're the ones who for some reason need to be authentic quote unquote and like I said I want my dream is to see the space and time given for more black people to be more diverse in their wild imaginations in the food world so that's what I wanted to see so for some people that idea of authenticity is somehow needed but I yeah I'm not really too bothered to be honest I think that everybody else should be able to uh, put their crazy visions to whatever they want to do. But is there, I mean, does there come a point where, I mean, do, do people have to be careful? Like what, what makes, um, if, if people just think, sod it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my, do my own take on this. Um, what do they need to be mindful of to make sure they're doing it properly or respectfully? Um, I will kind of like, there is an hashtag, um, Joel of Gate. Um, so if you want to go on Twitter to check it out. A um, couple years ago, Jamie Oliver in his infinite wisdom decided to cook jollof fries. And actually the shame about that experience is till today, if you were to Google jollof fries, Jamie Oliver's recipe is the first thing that comes up. No. Now, jollof rice is a, it's a, it's a dish that's cooked across West Africa and most West African countries. And it's, you know, it's a dish that actually creates rivalry within West African countries about who cooks the best jollof rice, where does jollof rice originate from, and what is the authentic jollof rice. The thing, interesting thing about jollof gates was when Jamie Oliver decided to cook his own version of jollof rice. This was the first time, you know, West Africans actually united to say, this is not jollof rice. This does not look, it doesn't feel, it doesn't have, you know, there were introductions of ingredients that you would not typically have yeah. in a jollof rice. So for me, when we think about authenticity and, you know, I agree with Riaz that, you know, we are, food is very transient and it's definitely informed by the places that we've lived, our previous experiences. I, for example, I grew up in Lagos first. 
So for me, the vibrancy of eating Nigerian food in Lagos is what I try to recreate here in London. And that's what I mean about it's authentic to my experience, but it's also authentic to my experience as a Yoruba woman who grew up in Nigeria. Because actually, if I was to be cooking food from a different tribe in Nigeria, it would have a different experience. I want to have the authenticity because I don't want those recipes to get lost. I'm raising a young black British daughter who doesn't tend to, who doesn't have the opportunity to go to Nigeria as frequently as I would like for her to have. But yet this evening I was able to fry puff puff for her the same way I was eating puff puff when I grew up in Lagos. So the only difference now is I am now putting together a recipe book because you know in food in Niger in most West in most African countries we don't typically measure our food so I remember when my mom taught me how to cook when I was 12 she didn't teach me with a recipe book she just told me you know you need to do this you do that you do this and there was no kind of like this is why you cook with this ratio or this is why you need to cook meat a certain way it's only now that I've been doing this as a business and having to actually have consistency in whenever I cook food especially when I was running my own restaurant that I actually got to understand the need for us to actually document our recipes and actually think about how are we passing those recipes on to the next generation so for me in as much as yes we can have our fusion and we can you know reintroduce new ingredients or we can deconstruct dishes i want my children i want my daughter and i want her the future generations to also learn the experience of actually cooking jollof rice the same way that you would cook it in lagos or you would cook it in a village in nigeria so I guess it's having the foundations, knowing the foundations, exactly. knowing how to do it. And exactly. Then so for me, authenticity is exactly authenticity is essentially that it's having the foundation. So you know, yes, you can have a jollof burrito, but that's not jollof rice. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. yeah. And so if you, if you can be, um, cause I've got another question after this that I think is is a good one. That be the last question, but yeah, please, Zoe. I just want to say on that that um, agreeing with Riaz largely that you know authenticity comes from the person preparing the dish and their relationship with the food and the culture it comes from if you don't have a direct relationship with the food culture from which you're cooking then you need to explain how you got there you need to explain where the original idea comes from and how many iterations it's gone through to be the version that you're you're showing us as your version right and that's what jamie oliver should have done in my house in my grandmother's house in Kaneshi market in accra there's three different women, right? Um, five years ago, I wanted each of them to teach me how to make jollof. They all showed me a completely different way, completely different way in the same household, but they're women from three different tribes, right? So to speak to the fact what's authentic for each of them is where they come from in Ghana and how they were shown to make it growing up. So that is gonna be different in every single circumstance. So there is no real thing I mean, authenticity doesn't exist because it will change from house to house, no matter what country you're in. There is a principle of a dish, and we all know that jollof is a one pot rice dish. It's gonna have some heat, it's gonna have some red pepper, it's gonna have some tomato and onion. We all know that that's the basics of jollof. But every household in West Africa is gonna cook it slightly differently. So authenticity as a label is so reductive, it's almost racist in my opinion. I think that's really interesting. I think it's interesting to have the different the different viewpoints. Um, and I think this will be the last question. So um, it's a question from Michelle. And if we can have quite short answers to this one so everyone gets to say. Um, to each speaker, what, what, has been, what has the support and feedback been like from your respective cultures? Uh, would you say there's a demand? Um, is, is there demand and is there support from Caribbean and um, Nigerian and Ghanaian, um, Zoe? Um, communities across the UK what's the, the feedback from from yeah from your own culture I think there's always going to be some it depends right if you if you're as Takondwe seems to be saying that you know she's doing straight up authentic Nigerian or what's authentic to her Nigerian um, there's obviously a receptive audience for that right but then there's another audience who might want to who are open to contemporizing that kind of food and you're always gonna have purists in any cuisine and any culture who are like, that's not the way my mother made it. So that can't be it, you know? But when, in my case, when you're trying to expand the idea of a cuisine, if you're trying to expand what else something could be, like what's the future of Ghanaian food, not 
what has the last 400 years of colonization made Ghanaian food into be, you know, what else, what else do we have to play with, with those ingredients and flavors? So, you know, I'm in a place where it's about kind of expanding what Ghanaian food is, not trying to tell people what it is. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, I've had lots of great support, but also there's lots of people who are purists and who don't get it and who don't like it. And that's okay. You know, I'm not here. That's to part of the fun, right? Having that conversation and, and those disagreements and those discussions. Uh, well, it's not an argument. It's like, this is what I do. You know, everybody doesn't have to like it. You know, it's, that's why there's plenty of other West African chefs out there because one of them will be cooking what you want, the way you want it, you know? If you don't want contemporary reimaginings and new West African cuisine, then you're probably not gonna come to me or Zoe's Garden Kitchen and you're definitely not gonna come to Sankofa if that's not what you're about. Okay, okay. Um, and um, I'll, Takombe, if I, if I can ask you that, but what's the, the reception been like? Um, I mean, the reception has definitely been great. Um, I don't think it's simply because I do authentic food. The feedback has definitely been along the lines of, you know, eating my food is, you know, reminds them of, you know, eating food at their grandmother's um, kitchen or and the kind of food that their mom cooked. So the reception has been great from um, Africans, from Nigerians, but it's also been great reception from people who are not who are new to the cuisine. And I think that to me is the key thing is whether you are eating food that is authentic. And I don't um, agree that authenticity is linked to racism or linked to colonialism. I think, you know, yes, even within the household, you can, whilst you can have differences, generally the if you go to Nigeria and you ask for patty jollof rice people know what they expect to be given in terms of what patty jollof rice is and that's what authenticity means to me so the reception has been great all around um every now and then you do get people who you know this is not for them and you know and that's fine and and you know we all have our own personal experiences with food so whether it's authentic or whether it's contemporary um and again, authentic doesn't necessarily mean that's not contemporary because actually what is authentic to somebody is contemporary to somebody else. So for me, it's really about, you know, what we bring into tasting a new cuisine or tasting, uh, an, tasting an old cuisine redefined a new way. Yeah, okay, okay. And, and Riaz, I mean, I, I guess that this is most pertinent to, to Bellyful, but for for these restaurants and these food businesses that have been running for so long with no recognition and then suddenly you come along and you celebrate them in, in your brilliant book which is still available by the way to download um what 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 was the feedback from 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 people who feature but then also in the wider community yeah it was supportive i think from the stance that as even though i did feature uh heavily the older restaurants i also wanted to get in some of the newer people in uh, the newer generation who are, as, you, as you, people have said, trying to look forward to what the future of Caribbean food can be. Uh, and I think there was a lot of support behind that because it made a lot of those purists uh, question themselves and, you know, question their own biases and prejudice towards that kind of that rigid look at their food and say, actually, it can be a lot more. And then people who are from the Caribbean and the wider region uh, were happy to see representation of you know different ethnicities different groups you know there's indian caribbeans there's asian uh, chinese caribbeans um and the bigger message behind that being that you know all black people don't represent each other uh you know i'm not i'm a straight man i'll never be a Ghanaian woman i'll never be a nigerian woman I, I i'm not coming from that perspective but the joy of that social media is that we all can support each other and while we're not the same and we don't represent each other we can all still support each other so i think that's what the one of the benefits of that has been i mean i think that's a brilliant note to end um Raz, thank you um and i yeah i concur concur and long may we support each other and build each other up um and thank you all of you for for joining the discussion um Riaz, Tukombo and Zoe um yeah you know I, I, I find that interesting I hope everyone else did. it's not really about me um so thank you very much and thank you to the British Library um thank you to Polly and Angela um for, for yeah for having us and thank you to everyone who's watched I hope you enjoyed it um and sorry I didn't get to all the questions there's some really really good questions I'm a bit gutted about that but there you go um thank you and enjoy the rest of your evening Thanks for having Thank me. You. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, you can, I don't know, DM me the, DM me the questions on Instagram, Rias Phillips. <laughs>
Yeah, and uh, and and Combo's Kitchen and, and Zoe Adonia, Um because someone did actually ask about about your project. Questions. I don't want loads of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Stay out of her space. Questions constantly having to answer. Yeah, boundaries. All right. Um, Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Hello, hello. I think they you don't disappear yet because I just want to thank you from the British Library. So I really fantastic discussion i mean there is so this definitely feels like this the start of an amazing conversation uh, it could go on for so much longer i did not want it to finish i've taken so many things away i'm sure everybody has i thought that was a fantastic i loved at the end you know you saying riaz you know all black people do not stand for all black people uh i thought that was wonderful and also this idea that you know you're all really standing for something and you're making such an impact and such a ch such a difference. Um, you know, I'm really looking forward to see like in a year's time when we do the next food season, I'd love to know, you know, what, if anything has changed, you know, what's still to play for so much. Um, amazing all the work you're doing. Crucially, I'm incredibly hungry after having listened to you all, which is also incredibly uh, important, but thank you very much for a wonderful, wonderful panel. Thank you so much for all the audience. There were so many questions. Clearly a lot of people have a lot of questions about this area. That's wonderful. Sorry, we didn't get to all those. If you've enjoyed uh, this evening, we've got two more events left on the Br British Library food season. On Friday, we have trading places in partnership with Borough Market, looking at the role of markets, supermarkets, small producers and community shops. Pretty vital questions given COVID and what that's done to retail and the way that we are all shopping at the moment. And then on Tuesday, our final event is coming live from the Hand and Flower with restaurant with Tom Kerridge and that will be our final event for this season so thank you very much thank you so much to KitchenAid for generously sponsoring the food season goodbye and see you all again soon